Come on. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all for joining the, the webinar today. Um, I see we already have 30 people here. Fantastic. Um, before we start, can we? I see some of you are typing. You already know what I'm about to say. We're doing a quick audio video check with you. Are you able to hear uh, and see us? There we go. Thank you, Ali. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, if this is your, your first uh, free forum webinar, I, I want to give you a little bit, just a, first, a quick introduction. First of all, thank you all for joining. Uh, today's webinar is being facilitated by Free Forum member TSS and Louis specifically. He's the, the managing director of TSS and he's prepared some very exciting messages for you around armored mobility. Um, thank you, Ivan. Um, so colleagues, we, this is a 30 minute uh, webinar. Um, we're, the, the way it works is Louis has prepared some slides. He will be presenting for approximately 15, 20 minutes. Um, of course, we want to make sure that you're all, many of you are experienced fleet managers. You might have some experiences you want to share, some questions you have. So we have reserved time at the end for your questions. Um, in the meantime, like you see some colleagues already doing, please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself your name, the organization, and the country you're calling from today. Perfect. Thank you, Anna and Tony. I see many of you are getting into the hang of it. Super. And throughout the webinar, if you have uh, experiences or points where you agree or disagree, it can always be a healthy debate with Louis, feel free to, to share those in the, in the chat box. Also raise your questions, and we'll take them at the end. It is a recorded webinar, so you will also be supplying you with the recording. Um, Louis, I, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much. And again, in case of any technical difficulties, I'm right here to, to support you. All right. Thank you, Nikita. <clears throat> uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, it is my pleasure to, uh, to be your host. Um, today, we'll be talking about the Golden Triangle of Armored Mobility. Um, as Nikita mentioned, my name is Louis Huizen. I am Managing Director of TSS. And uh, we've been a proud member of the Fleet Forum since uh, I think about eight years now. Um, so uh, before we dig right into it, I will tell you a little bit about what TSS does um, and uh, let's get to it. So um, we're a family business. Uh, my father founded the company in 1976. Uh, we've been an incorporated company since uh, 1999, and uh, counting today, there are 11 people in the team of TSS. We're located just south of the Netherlands, uh, sorry, just south of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and a member of also the uh, Netherlands Industry for Defense and Security, as well as Fleet Forum uh, and ESTA, uh, and we are also registered suppliers to NATO and the United Nations Global Marketplace. And because we think quality is one of the cornerstones of our uh, business, we're also ISO 9001-2015 ISO certified. Um, so th the, the core of our business uh, is basically uh, armor mobility. That's our, our slogan. Um, Traditionally, that's, that started with uh, supplying run-flat uh, inserts for armored vehicles. And uh, over the course of the years, we've expanded our product portfolio to not only have run-flat inserts, but also heavy-duty wheel assemblies, um, protected fuel tanks, which are self-sealing against puncture, um, vehicle intercoms, brake systems, heavy-duty suspension, um, also some shock mitigation products, which you don't see in this slide. Uh, and part of the reason that I'm here today is because we also like to share our knowledge um, with you, uh, the end users. <clears throat> so uh, that being said, let's move on and have a look at what does mobility actually mean to you. Um, so mobility, you could define it as getting from A to B. Um, the two images here uh, show that sometimes it can be challenging. Uh, image on the left is a uh, logistics truck, uh, which seems to be very stuck in mud. Um, roads are a relative um, relative term in this uh, in this context. Uh, the other image uh, is a um, is a pickup truck, 
which uh, ran into some difficulties. Um, I believe this was a result of a crash, not necessarily um, uh, an attack or anything. Um, anyway, the, what does mobility actually mean for you? So in the context of an armored vehicle, this is uh, a little bit different compared to a soft skin vehicle. So let's set the context a little bit. Um, armored vehicle, you have a high risk environment. Okay, tick that box. You've determined that you uh, have a need for an armored vehicle, uh, possibly more than one. Um, you've determined which uh, protection level uh, is required for this armored vehicle. So there's a few norms, uh, VR7, VR9 are two of them. Um, they're determined by a uh, independent uh, um, entity, which um, basically determines the criteria of, of which, uh, under, under which a vehicle is tested. Um, and finally, you need to think about the mobility components and the usability of the vehicle. Now, it's this last tick box that we are going to be talking about today. I'm going to assume that all the tick boxes above have been uh, fulfilled, that you know that you need an armored vehicle because you are in a high-risk environment, and that you've also determined the protection level that you need. So the, the, the red line through this whole presentation uh, is that an armored vehicle is not a soft skin vehicle. It is much heavier. You, you're uh, adding an armoring, armoring package, uh, which includes a lot of heavy steel. You're uh, adding uh, thick glass, uh, which stops bullets, um, which is increasing um, the vehicle weight as well as the dynamics uh, are, are being changed. So I'm, I'm not taking credit for the term, but there is a, uh, a term called the golden triangle of mobility. Um, we like to enhance that a little bit by uh, mentioning armored mobility. So what does this consist of? This consists of a heavy duty run flat wheel assembly. It consists of a heavy duty brake system and heavy duty suspension. All these parts the term heavy duty imp implies that it's not a normal standard uh, part, that it is enhanced somehow. But what does this actually mean? What are we actually talking about when we say duty? Let's have a look at the definition. Designed to be strong enough to do very difficult work for a long time. This is from the Cambridge Dictionary. Providing an unusual amount of power durability, etc., from dictionary.com. Um, so two, two items stand out here. One of them is uh, the longer time, the durability. Um, another one is that it um, has to be strong and able to, do, uh, to work under difficult circumstances. So have, let's have a look at the wheel assembly to start with. What are the considerations that you can have when uh, looking at a heavy duty wheel assembly? First thing, with, when we talk about a wheel assembly and the run flat wheel assembly especially, we're talking about three components basically. So we have the rim, uh, and because of the weight I mentioned before, it has an increased payload compared to the OEM rim. Um, not only is the vehicle heavier, but the weight distribution is also different. On a soft skin vehicle, usually you have the heavy part of the vehicle in the front, where the engine is, um, which is uh, about 60% of the vehicle's weight on the front axle and 40% on the rear axle. In the case of an armored vehicle, and I will show you some images later which illustrate this, the weight distribution is 40 on the front and 60 on the rear. So run flat system. Um, one of the key factors of the run flat system is how many kilometers of distance do you need to be able to drive with flat tires or so-called run flat mode. There's a few standards that are floating around in the market. One of them could be 30 kilometers uh, distance at 50 kilometers per hour. Then you have a norm called the PAS 301, 
which is a simulation basically of urban uh, driving conditions. So it includes uh, accelerating, cornering, um, braking, uh, all kinds of maneuvers. And then finally, you also have finally uh, I mean, is this list? Sorry, this list is not exhaustive, but in this uh, context, finally you have the Finnebel norm, um, which is a uh, NATO norm, uh, and this consists of 100 kilometers distance in total, uh, starting at a high speed, then going back to a lower speed, um, and, and it, this uh, reduces in steps. Um, Finally, you have the heavy duty tire. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, little browser hiccup. Um, so again, weight is an important factor in this. Uh, so you need to make sure that your load index is correct. The load index of this tire in the picture is uh, 128, and that corresponds with 1,800 kilograms or 3,600 kilograms on the axle. Um, so weight is one of them. Um, and you also need to make sure that the run flat uh, and the tire are um, in correspondence with, you, with each other. So your tire is not too uh, low for the run flat system. And the height of the run flat system is also determined by the speed or in the distance that you want to cover. Um, all the way at the bottom, you see a load index a table, which is supplied by the uh, manufacturer of this particular tire. And it also shows the correspondence or the, the correlation between uh, speed and uh, load index uh, and tire pressure, obviously. So moving on, um, have another look at the tire. Um, we talked about the load index, how much can it actually carry? And I just mentioned tire pressure as well. Now, bear in mind that when you lower your tire pressure, you are also lowering your load capacity. And this is not a linear uh, relation. So if you lower tire pressure by 10%, that does not mean that your um, load index uh, reduces by 10%. It'll be more than 10%, more like 15 or 20. And keep in mind that without your tires, there is no accelerating, there is no cornering, and there is no braking. And an important and I think very illustrative um, thing to keep in mind is that on average, the contact patch per tire of a vehicle, I'm not saying an armored vehicle here, it might be a bit bigger because of the tire size and the actual load on the, on the tire, but on average, the contact patch is about one hand palm per tire. So you're moving a vehicle around of uh, five and a half, maybe six tons, and there are only four hands basically keeping contact with the road surface. Now, looking at the brake system, you're looking at reinforced calipers. So these are strong steel calipers um, with uh, bigger pistons. Um, more robust and, and, and um, yeah, an unflexible uh, design. You've got larger and ventilated brake discs um, to work with the larger brake discs. You also need a larger friction surface on the brake pads and you have steel braided brake lines, which on the one hand, keep the um, brake line uh, compressed uh, but it also protects the brake line against um, foreign objects. So in this uh, context, you can consider whether the uh, brake system has been tested and validated by the vehicle builder. So has the vehicle builder actually driven uh, and approved the, uh, the brake system for his, uh, for his vehicles? Uh, and slash or has an independent institute approved the brake system for the added weight of the vehicle? And this can all be supported as well by a supplier's declaration. Now, one important note here is that specifically designed for use on an armored vehicle is not the same as the adaptation of a commercial product to work, uh, to be fitted on an armored vehicle. It's 
So specifically designed means that uh, all the characteristics of the vehicles, such as the increased weight, also the changed weight distribution, have been taken into account. So you have a heavier vehicle, uh, which means more energy and more heat buildup when you are braking. Um, and a word roadworthiness testing is really important because it uh, goes beyond the pure operational performance. So being able to stop. Um, it keeps in mind a few contingencies, such as loss of booster, uh, loss of capacity by, for example, half your brake system has been um, incapacitated by a broken brake line, for example. Uh, click, yes. Uh, and also it determines the maximum pedal force. So this basically means that the vehicle is operable independent of who's driving it. So somebody who is not uh, very strong, uh, doesn't have a lot of power in their legs or strength in their legs, can uh, still keep the vehicle um, and bring it to a standstill, um, even uh, though they're not a bodybuilder which uh, who can push away 160 kilos with one foot, for example. And another uh, consideration you can keep is if your brakes are really used as a safety measure, or as a security measure. In other words, is your brake system part of your protection package? So if you are in an ambush situation, like in this uh, image, this is actually an, an ambush, which happened in Mexico um, somewhere in the last two years. This vehicle probably had compliant brakes. So it met the requirements um, of being able to decelerate at a certain rate um, but the question remains, is it really the best pos possible braking uh, distance? So if you look at the arrow, it, is, um, it starts at a, a white line, or yeah, so what looks like a white line on the road surface. Um, the question remains, how well would the vehicle and its occupants have been able to get away from the threat if it had been able to stop two, uh, two lines behind? where the vehicle is now. So it would have been able to stop sooner and what would have ch the chances of survival or being able to get away have been in that situation. So then you're looking at your brake system, not only as something that makes your vehicle compliant, but also can help you escape dangerous situations. So looking at the suspension system, the primary function is reduce or absorb car vibrations generated from the road surface. It gives you comfort, uh, and mind you, your suspension system is uh, responsible for the comfort, not your tires. Your tires need to be inflated at the correct uh, pressure in order to be able to carry your vehicle. Lowering your tire pressure might be more comfortable, but it's not necessarily the safest option. Uh, and of course, your uh, shock absorbers and your suspension give you stability, uh, and that's related to the higher center of gravity. So you'll see here, uh, an image which shows you the protective cell of the vehicle. Um, the lower red dot on this vehicle is the, uh, it illustrates the center of gravity on a non-armored or a soft skin vehicle. Uh, when you armor the vehicle with the glass being above, um, um, in the top of the vehicle, you're also changing the dynamics of the vehicle. So it's handling, it's um, um, how much it wants to roll over when cornering. Uh, and this can, the gross vehicle weight per vehicle and the center of gravity per vehicle uh, builder can uh, differ as well. So uh, a lot of care and attention needs to be given uh, to that. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, your benchmark should really be the most difficult con uh, conditions and the fact that you are using a reliable and durable system. So. Some considerations for your suspension system. Um, obviously, you need a higher damping force uh, for the higher vehicle weight. Um, you need uh, reinforced springs, heavy duty components such as uh, bearings. Um, the springs need to be stronger and, and, and thicker, um, also related to the weight distribution. Uh, and uh, of course, you also, your sway bars need to be um, reinforced stronger 
and not only the sway bars, but also the components that connect them to the vehicle, such as the brackets and the bushing. So how do these three components relate? Uh, so I'm going to quick um, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, so all the components must function in harmony with each other. If one of them isn't performing optimally, it can have a negative effect on all the other components as well. So looking at tires and shock absorbers, uh, these can, uh, so incorrect pressure can cause um, um, uneven tread wear, illustrated by the red circle in the image, or it can uh, result in cupping, which causes more vibrations, which causes more uh, strain on the shock absorbers, um, higher fuel consumption, poor handling, longer braking distance. Um, these are all possible consequences. Um, incorrect tire pressure or load uh, on uh, over a longer period of time, time can cause a blowout, which causes uh, damage to the vehicle. The vehicle could be uh, limited in front flat performance because the tire is uh, seriously um, compromised, uh, and not alone. Uh, let alone the fact that the tire can blow out and uh, hurt bystanders. Unsuitable rims. Um, this could be related to the payload or even the design characteristics. Um, you can get a structural failure of the a failure of the rim. The vehicle comes to a standstill, uh, and there is also other collateral vehicle damage, such as um, the brake system being uh, damaged. Um, or even the rim, the tire and the rim uh, rolling away and hitting, again, an innocent bystander. So um, looking at this quality of the suspension system or uh, a poor uh, setup, again, tire wear, um, uncomfortable situations, um, like vibrations in the vehicle, uh, braking efficiency, um, eventually, the uh, dampers can start leaking or sweating, as it's also called. Uh, and this means that they don't have as much capacity to uh, absorb the shocks. So um, I've used the image of a tornado um, and managed or put two uh, aspects of what we've, what we've been discussing, uh, incorrect tire pressure and suboptimal suspension. These have an effect on poor braking, uh, on the braking performance. They have an effect on the stability of the vehicle. Of the short, uh, have a, an effect on the life cycle of the tires, uh, on the rims, the run flats, um, the durability of the suspension, and in the end, the result. It all gets sucked up, mixed up, and in the end, you have an inoperable vehicle. So, how do you set requirements for your components? Uh, it starts with what you define. So sometimes we see um, requests being made and they contain contradictions or ambiguities. So upgraded brake system, upgraded suspension system. These are generic terms, really. So you have to ask yourself, what am I getting if I order an upgraded brake system? Am I just getting me? upgraded? Yes. It's Time. me. <laughs> Time. Mm -hmm. And we have colleagues who want almost to ask you questions. Almost there. Okay, last right. 30 seconds. Yeah, there's almost there. Almost there. Yeah. As well. Okay. okay. Thank All you. right. Okay. So uh, taking away ambiguities is something that you can start with. Um, there's a few norms. Uh, the, the presentation will be shared later, so you can uh, have a look at these. Uh, these are some norms for run flat performance. Um, but in the end, what you really need to keep in mind is uh, that what you set is a fit for your mission, that you get test reports, so proof of what you're asking for and what is being claimed is true, and support, uh, seek support and information from the market. Um, and without mobility, your commercial or civilian armored vehicle is basically a sitting duck, one that's not so comfortable looking as this one. So thank you, Nikita. Questions. Alrighty, great. Yes, let's start. So I think um, I think you've sort of answered the first question already, but let me let me pull it up on the screen in um, one second. Just one second. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yes. Um, right. So yeah, um, 
the requirements, uh, there are a few standards in the market. Um, and what we see sometimes is that a standard is set, a requirement is set. But when we are in contact with the end user, uh, um, like here in the Netherlands, we have a few end users we are in touch with. And in conversation uh, with them, uh, the mechanics and the users of the vehicles, it, it turns out that the run flat performance, for example, doesn't really meet the operational requirements. So you could determine 100 kilometers, but if you only need 15 to get out of danger zone or to get support, then uh, 15 kilometers at a higher speed, for example, could be uh, what you need. Um, so you can go by some of the standards, uh, but don't just take them as granted, uh, as, as a given. Uh, think about what the, uh, what the context is. Okay. Thank you, Louis. Let's move on to the next question from Carlos. Sure. Uh, what would you recommend to operations that are required to join convoys? Uh, the facial expression. Yeah. <laughs> There's more of it already. Yes, Louis, continue. Well, uh, it's, it's always a balance between load and speed. And um, I don't actually, most tires are approved at high loads up until about probably 120 or 130 kilometers an hour, sometimes maybe 160. Uh, these are extremely high speeds for armored vehicles. Consider, um, you know, five and a half tons uh, traveling at 120 kilometers an hour. That really is high speed. Uh, especially in a convoy. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a balancing act, I guess. Um, but as a um, supplier of tires, I would always recommend against uh, uh, going faster than the, the speed that is on um, that the tire is rated for. Uh, and okay, this, and this then have, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. Uh, one more, one more question, and then we wrap it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. this one is from Ali. Uh, okay, thank you, Ali. Um, that again is dependent on what the vehicle builder uh, determines. So a tire could be uh, rated for, let's say, one thousand eight hundred kilos at five point five bar, but if the vehicle builder um, or the, or your supplier of the vehicle built a vehicle which only has, um, let's say, 3,000 kilos on the rear axle, then you wouldn't need the 1,800 per wheel. So uh, in that case, you could probably do with a, a lower tire pressure. Um, but it depends on the on the axle and the gross vehicle uh, load. Uh, but once again, I would never go below what is recommended. Um, as this uh, can basically it basically destroys your tire from the inside. It, it might not be visible, but when you have a blowout, it will come as a surprise. Super. Thank you, Louis. Okay. We run out of time, so I just want to quickly wrap up, colleagues. Thank you for 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 joining today. I think I, we had like approximately forty participants. So thank you all for 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 joining, for introducing yourself, awesome. for raising questions. Louis, a big thank you to you for preparing the messages today for. Making sure, like Card said, very informative session uh, and a lot of useful information. So thank you for that. Um, colleagues, we thank have you. a webinar. So exactly. Thank you, Louis. We're going to be sharing the recording of the webinar. Um, and we have a, a webinar taking ne place next week around rental vehicles and how to manage um, and monitor their, their performance. So I hope to see you all over there. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.